Greetings everybody, welcome to another episode of Counterpunch with Trevor Loudon, the show that uh, exposes and fights back against the unfolding communist revolution in the United States and internationally. So this episode, start looking at Mr. Biden's cabinet. Now Joe Biden has already started getting people organized for his new cabinet and many of them have communist backgrounds. I've said repeatedly that we are in a communist revolution, that Joe Biden, if he becomes president, will usher that in. And some people think, well, that's a little bit hyperbolic, that maybe it's an exaggeration. But when you're choosing actual Marxists for your cabinet, to me that's a little bit of an indication of where you're going. The one I thought I'd look at today is Pete Buttigieg. Now some of you may remember him, he ran for president in 2020. He was the young guy from um, South Bend, Indiana, Mayor Pete they called him. And he's a, a young guy, quite a good looking guy, and a, a sort of moderate liberal Democrat. That, that's what he ran on. Um, and now he is being proposed as Secretary of Transportation. Now people think, well that's a bit of an obscure post, but if you think about the role of transportation in American society, food production, food distribution, the military aspects of it alone. It's a very, very important post, a very strategic post, as any military strategist will tell you. And Pete has some military experience. He was in the uh, military for about a year. He never went through boot camp. He just got parachuted straight in. And he served as, a, as an assistant in the intelligence department in Afghanistan for about seven months, I believe. So that's his military experience. But Pete Buttigieg is the son of a man called Joseph Buttigieg. Now Joseph Buttigieg was a professor at Notre Dame University, which is a course based in South Bend, Indiana. Very, very famous Catholic university. But Joseph Buttigieg was a Marxist. He died early in 2020, but he was a full-blown, hardcore Marxist. He was... Um, on the board of um, Rethinking Marxism, for instance, a famous Marxist journal. And he served with people like Janetta Cole, who was actually denied a position in the Clinton administration because she was too radical. The US Senate at the time refused to pass her, refused to endorse her because she was involved in the Vence Ramos Brigade, which was set up by the KGB and Cuban intelligence to recruit spies and to serve in the United States. She was involved in Communist Party fronts for years, but Bill Clinton tried to get her put into a very senior education department position. So Joseph Buttigieg served with her. He served on the board of the Left Forum, which was a uh, used to be called the Socialist Scholars Conference. Obama went there as a young man at Columbia University. It was a major conference held every year in New York. Communists, socialists, Marxists from all over the world would gather. They held many, many forums and Joseph Buttigieg was on the, uh, was on the leadership of that. In 1998, he was a big part of the celebrations for the Communist Manifestivity. That was the 150th anniversary of Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. And here was Joseph Buttigieg serving on that, a big part of the celebrations, celebrating the founding of the, of the modern communist movement. But the biggest thing Joseph Buttigieg was known for was his leadership of the International Gramsci Society. Actually served as president of that organization at one point. He was the leading Gramsci scholar in the world. He wrote books about Gramsci. He translated Gramsci's works. Hello, uh, I'm Joseph Buttigieg. I am the president of the International Gramsci Society and I am a professor of literature at the University of Notre Dame in the United States. But who is Gramsci, do you say? Well, Gramsci, I believe, is one of the most important communists of the 20th century, second only, in my view, to Vladimir Lenin. 
Antonio Gramsci was a, a theoretician with the Italian Communist Party. And after World War I, he became very active in the party. And the Italian Communist Party was extremely strong. But the Italian Communist Party got in a bit of a fight with another group of socialists, Mussolini's fascist organization. Mussolini had been the editor of the Italian Socialist Party's newspaper, but he veered off into a more of a, a fascist socialist direction, while Gramsci and the Italian Communist Party was more in a Leninist socialist direction. They got in a big fight. It was two street gangs fighting for territory, both socialists. And so eventually Gramsci winds up in jail, and he spent 11 years until his death in a, in a fascist prison. So he had a lot of time to do some writing and thinking. And his prison notebooks are very famous. They are the foundation for much of what we see in the world communist movement today. And this was his theory. Gramsci theorized that Lenin was wrong, that Marx wasn't quite right either. Because see, Marx and Lenin believed that the industrial working class would be so oppressed by capitalism, so ground down, that they would just revolt, throw off their chains, revolt from their misery, and take over the state. You know, take the wealth of the bourgeois, have a big socialist revolution. Marx thought this was inevitable. It would happen as a process of history. Lenin thought he would use his organizational skills to speed it up and consolidate his power once it happened. Lenin was all about, Marx was all about the theory of revolution. Lenin was the technician. How do you speed it up? How do you take control of it? How you keep control once you've won? Lenin famously said, it is not the winning of power that counts, it is the keeping of power. So Lenin was all about dividing your enemies, the tactics you needed to win, um, cracking down on your opposition. What we see with the deep state, that's Lenin. That is essentially Lenin, using the organs of the state to suppress your enemies, dividing your enemies, vilifying your enemies. That's all Lenin. And Trump has been up against Lenin's theories for his entire four years of his presidency. But after World War I, there had been several communist revolutions in Europe. You know, we had the initial one with the Bolshevik Revolution, and the, the Bolsheviks seized power in Russia under Lenin. They took a few years to consolidate their power. By the time that Stalin came along, about 1929, I believe it was, the Soviet state had fully consolidated its power and pretty much wiped out all of its opposition. There might have been a few little partisan bands in Ukraine or, or something, but pretty much they controlled that state from top to bottom. So, but in Europe, it hadn't gone so well. See, what Lenin thought, what Marx had, had postulated was that when conditions got really bad for the workers of Europe, as they did after World War I, they were poverty stricken, they were bitter from the war, they were, you know, they'd lost a lot of people, they'd fought a war they didn't understand, you know, the reason for. So they were embittered. Just a little side note. This is how the communists used to recruit people back at that time. There was a famous communist uh, KGB manual at the time, just after World War II, how to recruit spies for the communist movement. And it wasn't find a communist, find somebody who had, was a socialist or who believed in your cause. This was one of the instructions. Find a good looking man who lost an arm or a leg in World War I, who lost an arm or a leg in the war, because such a man would be embittered and such a man would be easily recruited to the Soviet cause. Nothing to do with ideology, just tapping that embitteredness that you would find in a lot of veterans at the time, especially in the countries who had been vanquished. So, the, um, 
Everybody expected in the communist movement that they were going to sweep through Hungary, they were going to sweep through Germany, Austria. It was all going to fall to communism. You'd soon have a communist Europe. Not long after that, you'd have a communist America. The world would be one to communism. And it was supposed to happen, according to Marxist theory, in the industrialized countries first. That was not, not the third world countries. Russia was an anomaly. It was supposed to happen in Germany and Britain and the United States and Canada before it ever happened in a backward country like Russia. But these revolutions took over in Germany and Hungary especially. There was a Hungarian communist government for a short time, but they were overthrown. They were overthrown because the workers didn't support them. And in fact, the workers often supported the police and the forces of the existing government. The workers proved to be quite conservative. They were not buying into this communist revolution. And this really confused the communist theoreticians of the time. You know, surely the workers see that socialism is the way, that, that communism is the way of the future. Why are they standing against the revolution? And Gramsci had the answer. He thought about this for a very long time. He wrote about in his books, in his famous prison notebooks. And this was his theory. The reason the workers are not rising up to support communism and socialism is because for hundreds of years they've been brainwashed by the church and the culture and the capitalist society. They think they're part of this capitalist society. The church has taught them to be obedient to authority and to put God above civil government, to think of spiritual matters, you know, to think of the reward in the, in the life hereafter rather than what's happening on the, in the earth right now. And the culture, the art, the, the literature, all glorified the establishment. It all glorified God. It all glorified the king and the existing society. So the people were brainwashed. They were conditioned over hundreds of years to accept the capitalist state. So when these Bolshevik revolutionaries came along and wanted to smash the state and raise the workers up, the workers were saying, heck no, we're, we're part of this. This is our country, this is our society. We don't want you radicals coming along and upsetting us, trying to destroy our churches and our education system. We like it as it is, thank you. Go away. So Gramsci realized that what he called this was cultural hegemony. Capitalism, the church, had hegemony, power over society. So to have a communist revolution, you're going to have to destroy that hegemony. And you couldn't take it on head on like Lenin was trying to do because the people would just not accept it. They weren't conditioned the right way. So what did you have to do? Gramsci said you had to get into the every segment of society and start bringing in socialist ideas. You had to bring social justice into the churches. You had to infiltrate Hollywood, the, the culture. You had to subtly moving people's consciousness through the culture, through the church, through the education system. You had to take over the unions. You had to take over the entertainment industry. Even sports was a target. And you see that today when all these football teams are taking the knee to Black Lives Matter and just trying to outdo each other on how politically correct they can all be. And political correctness, that we, the term we often hear, really is, really is derived from Gramsciism. You know, you have to change the values of society and impose those values gradually through the education system, Hollywood, infiltrating the political parties, not just the communist political parties, all of the political parties, until that society is so conditioned to socialism, it will fall into your lap. The, the people will beg for the revolution.
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of young kids who supported Bernie Sanders, the Bernie bros, they are Gramsci's grandchildren. They are the product of massive indoctrination of America's kids in the schools, in the churches, by the culture in general, through Hollywood, the comic books, you name it. That's Gramsci. So Gramsci became very, very popular in the 60s in the counterculture. The yes radicals, the, the people who fought the Vietnam War, they were inspired by Mao Tse Tung and Gramsci. And one of the main groups in that, that came out of the SDS was a group called the New American Movement. That came out of a split in the Communist Party and former SDS radicals. And they were very, very Gramsci oriented. They believed in infiltrating the culture. A lot of them went into Hollywood. A lot of them went into the unions. Many of them became ap academics. In 1982, that group amalgamated with the uh, Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee and became Democratic Socialists of America. The group we know today, 85,000 members. Ocasio-Cortez is a member. Rashida Tlaib is a member. Cory Bush, a new member of Congress, is a member, and so is Jamal Bowman, who's also recently been elected to Congress. Gramsci is in the Congress, Gramsci is in society, Gramsci is in the education system of this country, and Gramsci is sure in the churches, 100%. He's right in there. Gramsci died 60 years ago now, but he's never been more influential than he is today. So this new organization, Democratic Socialists of America, was explicitly Gramsciist. It was, Gramsci was a huge part of their raison d'etre, their, their method of working. Democratic Socialists of America was basically the new Communist Party in America. The old Communist Party USA had been very heavily discredited in the 1950s. Everybody knew it was a tool of the Soviet Union and it was very hard for the Communists to work inside the Democratic Party at the time. You know, Kennedy President Kennedy was making speeches about, about communism all the time. His brother was going after the communists. The American Communist Party was having a very hard time. So Democratic Socialists of America was really set up as a new communist party, not with a communist name, Democratic Socialists of America. So it's democratic. So it's only socialist, it's not communist. A friend of mine was talking, this is unbelievable. A friend of mine was talking to an FBI guy not long ago and said, you guys should be looking at Democratic Socialists of America. They are hugely dangerous. And this FBI guy said, oh no, no, we can't go after them. They're democratic. The guy is unbelievable, you know. North Korea, their official name is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The old East Germans, you know, the East German Communist Party. East Germany was officially the German Democratic Republic. We need to understand what the word democratic means in a communist context. Democratic Socialists of America is a communist organization. And they all say they're democratic because they represent the will of the people. The Communist Party used to say it was democratic because they were representing the will of the people. And who are the representatives of the people? Well, it's the Communist Party, of course. So therefore, democracy is the will of the people as represented by the Communist Party. So whatever the Communist Party says, because it's the will of the people, that's democratic. And that's what Democratic Socialists of America means. Well, Pete Buttigieg, let's get back to Pete. So he grew up with this. He grew up with Gramsci. That was, I'm sure they talked about it over the dinner table all the time, because his father was the leading Gramsci scholar on the planet. Now, I'm sure they talked about baseball and other stuff, but you know, what do you, what do you think they talked about? As a teenager, Pete Buttigieg got himself on the Democratic Socialists of America mailing list. He admits that. As a young high school student in 2000, he won an inter, a, a national essay competition. It was a competition 
uh, to name your hero and write about your hero. And guess who he wrote about? Bernie Sanders, the socialist from Vermont, the man who's so in bed with DSA, is actually a DSA member as far as I'm concerned. He's been named as one on several occasions. This DSA Marxist, this was the hero that Pete Buttigieg chose and he won, won a nationwide essay contest on that. So. Pete is a Rhodes Scholar. He comes back to South Bend, Indiana, eventually becomes mayor. Well, South Bend, being a university town and having a, a quite a strong industrial base, Honeywell, a big agricultural components firm, is, uh, implements firm, is, has a big plant there, for instance. It's a pretty socialist town because you've got the industrial component, you've got the university component. And one of the main groups in that town for many years is a group called Jobs with Justice. Jobs with Justice is what we used to call a communist front. It's run by people from the Communist Party, from Liberation Road, but mainly in, in South Bend from people from Democratic Socialists of America, the Gramsciists. And Pete worked very, very closely with Jobs with Justice. He went to their meetings. He supported them when they went on strike against Honeywell, for instance. He was right there with Tony Frohler of DSA supporting that strike. He was also very heavily involved with a Jobs with Justice affiliated group called La Casa Amistad, an illegal immigration support group. He even introduced a card that illegal immigrants could use to get government services, you know, driver's licenses, access to benefits, that kind of thing. He was completely involved with these communists, working with guys like Tony Frohler and with Lee Gloucester from the Communist Party. He was their friend. So when he goes on the campaign trail, you know, Democratic Socialists of America sort of um, ignored him a little bit. They even criticized them for being more of a too, too moderate because they were all in for Bernie. You know, the Bernie movement was completely run by Democratic Socialists of America and the Communist Party USA and the pro-Chinese Liberation Road. It was a completely communist movement. But DSA does this, you know, when Obama was running, DSA would put up big signs saying, you know, we're socialists, but Obama's not, because they were very sensitive that Obama was being called out for his very, very strong connections to Democratic Socialists of America and the Communist Party, terrorist groups, etc. So, so they did the same with Pete Buttigieg. They'd sort of deny him, you know, they would sort of um, pretend he really wasn't one of theirs. They wouldn't heavily criticise him, but they would say he's a bit too, too moderate for us. Well, it just happens that Pete sort of still kept his arm in with, with Democratic Socialists of America. For instance, there was a strike in Cape Cod in July 2020 and a bus driver strike. And here's Pete, big support of the strike, got himself photographed with the supporters. Well, that strike, the support network for that strike was run by Virginia Diamond and Jules Bernstein, both Democratic Socialists of America supporters. So Pete was in there showing he's still on the team. He's still part of the movement. Here's a photograph of Pete with Jose Garza from Austin, a member of Austin Democratic Socialists of America, who is now the DA, the district attorney for that city. And I'll do a show in the near future about the number of Marxist district attorneys that have been put in place by the communists all around your country. Their job is to basically go soft on crime, to create chaos, which is all part of the revolutionary process. So Pete Buttigieg kept his hand in with Democratic Socialists of America. He has a history with them going back to his teenage years. But Gramsci always taught, you don't show your hand. You introduce socialist ideas pretending that's something else. You introduce programs. You know, Pete has openly said that the old anti-socialist ways of the past are gone, that young people should embrace socialism now. 
but he isn't that explicit when it comes to public office. What he does is just support socialist programs, works with socialist people, helps socialist causes, but doesn't identify himself as a socialist. That's how Gramsci told people they should work. If, if it's true that if we embrace a far left agenda, they're gonna say we're a bunch of crazy socialists. If we embrace a conservative agenda, you know what we're, they're gonna do? They're gonna say we're a bunch of crazy socialists. So let's just stand up for the right policy, go out there and defend it. That's the policy I'm putting forward. And Pete Buttigieg learned his Gramsci from the world master of the subject. So if this man becomes Secretary of Transport, you'll be putting, America will be putting its, one of its most strategic sectors into the hands of a covert Marxist. Is there any danger in that? Well, hopefully Pete will not get, even if Joe Biden becomes president, Pete Buttigieg will not be accepted. He will be exposed in his Senate hearings and he will be voted against which given the very close nature of the Senate is not a given and given the fact that you have people like Mitt Romney and others who are basically Democrats in the Republican side even if Pete is exposed for what he is possibly he could still get the job so this is why you know vetting is so critical Pete Buttigieg was never vetted by the media some people like myself exposed his Gramscianism, his Marxism, his ties to Democratic Socialists of America, but it never got mainstream coverage. So please, get this out there. Americans need to understand we're in a Marxist communist revolution right now. Biden is aiding and abetting that. Kamala Harris is right on board with it. If we're to save this country from revolution, the agents of revolution must be exposed. So if you believe that what I'm telling you is valuable, please like this show, please subscribe, please tell your friends to subscribe, and send this episode and other episodes out to as many of your friends as we possibly can. The only way we're going to save this country is by in massively increasing the awareness of people on the revolution that's unfolding and building the resistance we need to take this country back. So thanks so much for watching. I hope you found it interesting. Remember, like us, subscribe to us, support Counterpunch with Trevor Loudon. Thank you so much and God bless America.